Hello and welcome back to another edition of Stager Insights. Today, I'm really excited to bring our guest, Oliver Heath, all the way from Brighton, England. Hello, Oliver. Hi, Christine. So Oliver has a really unique approach to healthy living, and I want to explore that from the design perspective today. So Oliver, can you tell us what, what it is that you do and tell our audience more about the subject matter? Yeah. So I'm the founder of the eponymously named Oliver Heath Design, and we are writers, researchers, designers, and advocates for health and well-being in the built environment, with a particular specialism in this area called biophilic design, which essentially is how we enhance the human connection to nature in the buildings that are so important to our lives. So um, biophilic design essentially is, uh, there are kind of three key aspects. Part of it is about how you connect with real as um, uh, connections to nature. So that's the sort of sensory aspects. It's sort of natural light, fresh air, plants and trees and water. And then there's the indirect connections, which are basically about how we connect with natural references. So natural colors, materials, textures, and patterns. And the third aspect is how we create spaces that are both exciting and stimulating, but also calming, relaxing, and restorative. So we spend a lot of our time um, looking around the internet for research papers that underpin it, that create sort of a, a business case. And then we write either books or white papers or online courses. Um, and then um, we, we apply those ideas to design projects. And also we have an online course as well. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today, because I've been fascinated with this concept ever since, I would say, probably 2007, when I started building the design element for our staging program. And I think stagers are really in a unique position to influence both sellers and buyers of property and influence how they move forward and live in profit in their house once they've um, relocated or once they've settled. Part of our um, our design processing has always included this nature element, but definitely not to the degree that um, you have. And when I started to look at biophilic, I thought it was a new trend that started, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, but it's really been around since the 70s, right? When we started talking about it and people were writing articles and books about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we've come a long way, I think, since uh, covid people's awareness of having a healthier house and it yes. can be influenced by the decor and the stimulated by the items that you bring into your space so maybe you could uh, explain to people how all of the elements that we have in our home affect our health and well-being yeah. well I, I, well i think in our eyes, biophilic design is really what we call an evolutionary design ethos, which means that actually for a vast amount of human evolution, we've existed in very close connection to nature for our basic human survival. So there was a, a requirement for our forebearers to be able to identify landscapes that, that could help them to survive, thrive and flourish, but also those landscapes that were potentially threatening to survival. So if as a, as a cave person, you were looking out over a lush, green, healthy savanna environment where you could see grass and trees and plants and bushes, and you could see pools of water, um, you had a sense of prospect, so you could see potential predators, but also opportunities for hunting and gathering, then you'd feel pretty confident that you were standing in a landscape where you could survive, thrive and flourish. And essentially, biophilic design suggests that we have quite literally a genetic inheritance that still allows us to recognize landscapes that can support healthy life, landscapes that uh, deliver on all those intended aspects of fresh air, natural light, where we can see potential predators, threats, opportunities. Um, great sort of spaces where we know that we will be happy, calm and relaxed and that will deliver all, all of the kind of functionalities that we need. So biophilic design, although it was only really started to be discussed in the 70s by the likes of Eric Fromm and Edward O. Wilson, mm -hmm. it's actually an evolutionary design ethos. So it goes back. And in a way, what's nice about it is that it's it's um, it's what we call a universal design ethos in, in as much as everybody's had a good experience of nature. And what we try and do with biophilic design principles is elicit a similar physical, mental and an emotional response 
to a space as we have when we're surrounded in multi-sensory forms of nature, whether that's by the beach in a forest or in the mountains or just relaxing in the park. And so what we're trying to do is sort of bring back some of those very positive physical and emotional responses to those spaces and try and get people to feel a similar sense of calm, relax or focus or stimulation in an interior space. All right, so if we have uh, just isolate one situation, uh, work at home space. You know, more and more people are getting dedicated areas within their house. Certainly here in, in North America, we are. Uh, and I read a, an article recently that said 75% of people who actually leave the house and go to work are at a point in their work where they're frustrated because their environment is not making them feel good and be healthy. And that 75% of them were actually considering leaving their job if their current employer will not improve the environment. And I thought, oh, well, that means that more and more people are really wanting to live and work in more healthier um, sort of nurturing environments. And I thought, well, if people go on vacation and we know how relaxed you get, usually about the third day, and it's hump day and you've only got three more days before you have to come back, you bring with you that sense of well-being uh, and enjoyment and, and relaxation, whether that was in the mountains or it was, you know, by the ocean. So I've sort of always thought of reinforcing that uh, memory that you have with the visual, you know, a big piece of art that reminds you of a place, not necessarily a photograph, but just as you work, you know, your eyes can rest and your, your cellular structure will bring that feeling of sense of well-being. One of the challenges that we currently face in introducing this concept today, uh, not so much in somebody having a house built or renovated, but more in the genre that I'm in, which is getting property ready for sale and then perhaps helping the new buyer and, new, and seller when they move. Uh, so it's like it's a whole education process for more than the recipients. It's the real estate agents themselves. You know, they want to get that listing on the market. They want to get it sold quickly. And this intervention that we're seeing that's developed really over the past 10 years is slow down, get the listing papers done, but allow the time that's necessary to really prepare the house for the future buyer and the way that they want to live in that space. So when I, I read your books, um, I've you know been a fan of yours for a long time. And then I just happened to go back to your site uh, a couple of months ago and realized that you do have a course to teach biophilic design. And, um, and that was when I got in contact with you again. So I'd like you to talk, if you will, about that particular online program. Uh, because we are going to be, you know, showing that to our public and to our membership. Um, and I'd like them to see a little bit more about or hear a little bit more about what's actually involved in that program. Yeah. Over the last 10 years, much of our work has been focused on commercial spaces, the likes of workplace, hospitality, healthcare, and education spaces. Mm -hmm. And we were very conscious that there was a, a wealth of information about how we can bring biophilic design into those spaces and the research that underpins it that creates a very compelling business case. But there was a real lack of focus and interest in the spaces that we spend so much of our time in, which are our homes. And so what we wanted to do was to create uh, an online resource to help um, anybody in the building industry, whether they're architects, interior designers, or home stages, to think about how they could bring these nature connections into their homes in a, in a way that was relevant to them uh, and a cost-effective way, and use it as a design framework rather than trying to be too prescriptive and say, this is exactly how biophilic design is. So the course that we wrote it's really in two parts. There's an introduction, firstly, to biophilic design, trying to explain what it is, where the idea comes from, how it's an evolutionary design ethos, um, looking at some of the kind of core principles and ideas behind biophilic design. Then the second part of this is really how we implement biophilic design in the home. Now, in this, what we do is we, we dive into what we call the 14 patterns of biophilic design, 
And we look at how those ideas can be implemented into the home. So to do that, what we do is firstly, we explain what the pattern is, and then we uh, explain that in detail and give some examples. But we also encourage our, our kind of course attendees um, to create their own Pinterest boards so that they can create boards that help them develop the look and the feel of that particular pattern in their own style so that they then have an online resource to refer back to. So once we've gone through the 14 patterns, what we want to do is try and embed this knowledge into people's minds. So we, we have a series of sort of challenges or tests that they can undertake to then bring the patterns into biophilic design in different ways across a range of different spaces. And at the end of it, you get a certificate to demonstrate that you've been through the course. And I thought that was a really good aspect of the course, too, where you, you do challenge them to go out and then look within their own space and what they want to do with it. So over a period of time, then someone is a, who is a home stager, um, you might not know this, but what the one of the things that we teach them to do to expand out their business when you've helped that person to uh, get that property sold is to still market after the sale and help them in their new house. So I see that as a transition. I mean, a lot of people who become home stagers ultimately have been decorators or have a decorating gene in their body. So I mm -hmm. see this as really, uh, you know, a 2023 opportunity to expand out your business, regardless of what the real estate market is doing, because in the UK and I think around the world, everybody's suffering with the interest rates and all the things that are happening in the economy and whatever will happen with the Ukraine war. Um, you know, and supply chain issues and all of those things. So I think this is a really great way for people to look inwardly for themselves and then apply it out in a business sense. Um, what do you see as one of the major challenges of someone uh, taking this approach to their work? Well, I think firstly, when you're presented with an empty property, you are asking a potential buyer to imagine how they might live in it. So if somebody is looking around an empty property, there is a sense of placeless, placelessness. And there's, it's quite a large demand to imagine for everybody to go, oh, I can see how I'd live here and, and I'd sit at this chair and gaze out the window. So what we're trying to do is help people to create a sense of identity. You know, it's nature-based placemaking. Um, as I said, it, this idea of biophilic design is a universal design ethos. So it's it's sort of has this kind of appeal to almost everybody. Um, so it's much less polarizing than other design styles. And hopefully we'll get people engaged with understanding what a space is to be used for and how they could use it. So I think there's a fantastic opportunity for uh, home stages to help people understand how a space can be used, how it can be used to its best degree, so that, you know, if, for instance, you are creating a, a home office, how somebody could sit and be working at a desk, gaze out the window, have lots of natural light coming in, benefit from the gentle movement of the nature outside to introduce natural colours and textures that can be very calming and restorative, um, and create somewhere where people can sit and focus all day. I think the challenges, as ever, is is, you know, first and foremost, probably about the money. Uh, there's, there is a perception that biophilic design is going to be expensive or more expensive than conventional design. But actually we've written white papers about exactly this subject. And there is lots and lots of things that you can do, very simple things that you can do um, to introduce elements of nature. You know, it can be as simple as choosing a natural color scheme, making the most of natural light, keeping your windows clean, instead of having sort of uh, screens over your windows or curtains covering them pull those curtains back, keep the windows clean, uh, remove obstructions, allow natural light to flood in. So there are lots of very simple, straightforward design solutions uh, that don't have to cost any money at all, but that will sort of quite imperceptibly improve the quality of the space. So I think it's important. And what we try to do in the course is to help people overcome the concept that biophilic design is going to be expensive. Um, I think other things is looking for design inspiration, but I think one of the beauties of biophilic design is it's very much about looking around you and the natural environment that surrounds a property. We talk about a concept called a cultural and ecological attachment to place. And this is very much about creating a space that feels right, that feels connected to the local environment. So look 
beyond the walls of the property for color inspiration, for material inspiration, and find ways of interweaving that so that the feel the property um, feels like it's part of that sense of place. And you've created an holistic journey from the front door uh, through the through the garden, from uh, through the front door and into the property. So it all feels like it's connected. And when you're in that property, you're constantly referring back to the nature outdoors. The spaces may be in a local garden, maybe in, in a local park or a natural nature reserve, that you're referring back to these so that it feels connected and right and appropriate. And that allows people to bring back that positive memory they have of those spaces and feel essentially just happier, more calm and more relaxed in the space. Have you ever had um, interactions with uh, the demographic millennial? Because those are about 40% of the new home buyers. They're a driving force for the first time buyer. And also, you know, I, I feel um, one of the demographics that's leading, leading uh, this concept of actually having a move-in ready house as opposed to your old house and I've got to fix it when I move in. Um, they tend to want a lot of instant now and they're not here for a long time. There's a sort of life, I don't know what the word is really that I'm thinking of when I think about this because I think you know that that little phrase, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, Sort of That's sort of transience. There's a transience. Yeah, it. you know, yeah. so how do we get them encouraged in this concept? Because I find unless you've actually been introduced into like going in the forest and fishing and those types of leisurely nature structured um, uh, hobbies, or let's call them, when you were small, you bring that with you into your life. But if you've always lived in an urban environment, if your family has always been in an apartment, um, does it just naturally occur that there's a craving for more outside uh, your current environment? Um, How do like you I get this care, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, the, um, you know, Millennials are coming into that age group where they are having to uh, recognize they have a responsibility to the wider natural environment. I think um, also it's worth recognizing that during the COVID pandemic, everybody was locked down. And I think as a result of not having that wider diversity of spaces that they would ordinarily have, you know, um, leaving apartments or houses, traveling into work, going to cafes, um, going to work going to restaurants at lunchtime, maybe cinemas, theatres or bars afterwards and then coming home. You know, prior to the pandemic, people were having quite a diversity uh, of, of experiences of different spaces throughout their daily lives. And then when we started to get locked down, I think everybody realised that actually the four walls that you surround yourselves in do have an enormous impact on your physical, mental and emotional well-being. So I think there was this sort of greater revelationary moment that actually, if you're going to be indoors in a single space, then you're going to need to find somewhere to relax and restore and recuperate. And nature was very often the answer. So I think as a result, there was this, this so far greater recognition of the role that um, nature plays. And without a doubt, there is um, a greater understanding about looking after one's mental well-being now than there ever was in yes. my day. Yeah. So the conversation around mental well-being, mental health is much louder, much more vocal, much more frequent. Uh, they don't have any stigmas about it. And I think there is a sort of general recognition that one of the routes to supporting that is, uh, you know, deep, meaningful, natural immersions. So I think whether or not they've had those formative experiences as a child, uh, many still will have done that. Um, still, there is a, an understanding that that nature plays kind of key role. And from the work that we're doing uh, in other building sectors like workplace mm -hmm. and hospitality, um, biophilic design is rising up the agenda enormously. And there is, without a doubt, a greater recognition of the role that, that nature plays both outside and also inside property. One of the concepts of, you know, general well-being, and we know that is, you know, our our own feeling. But I read a few uh, sort of research papers on how it's actually improved health within hospitals and the concept of that healing faster. 
aspect. Do you have any any statistics or any research that you can share about that element? Uh, because what I'm seeing happening more and more is that people, when they're moving, are buying larger homes and actually now bringing their parents into it or they're having their adult children come live with them. You know, so they're going into more of sort of a mansion size house than they would mm -hmm. normally so that you have this interfamily integration and and often with parents, you know, you're going to have to deal with illness. Um, is there anything that supports that this sort of an environment will help heal? Yes. And, just, and this is one of Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say it's always just improving well-being, which is good, but not necessarily improving the health. Physical well-being. Yeah. Yes. I and mean, this is one of the most interesting things for me about biophilic design is it's what we call an evidence-based approach. So it does have uh it's backed up by 30 years of empirical research studies that are peer-reviewed that demonstrate again and again connections to nature have an ability to improve intended outcomes but reduce negative costs uh, and this has been demonstrated across a range of different building typologies so for instance the study that you mentioned uh, about uh, views onto trees uh, in healthcare scenarios was a study by Roger Ulrich back in the 1980s, where he looked at the recuperation rates of patients coming out of gallbladder surgery. Um, and what he found was that patients that were recuperating, um, looking onto trees as opposed to a uh, brick wall, actually recuperated 8.5% faster. Um, which is quite amazing, and it's nearly 10%. And separate studies have shown that actually patients that recuperate in natural light feel less pain, and as a result of that, require 22% less post-operative pain care medication. Studies such as this have been shown again and again across different building typologies. In the workplace, um, we've seen that actually where elements of nature are present, there's a 6% improvement in productivity, uh, a 15% increase in perceived uh, well-being. Um, other studies have shown that actually when, when uh, office workers have the best possible view as opposed to the worst, um, there are significant improvements in their cognitive functioning. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen uh, elements of nature reduce absenteeism by 15%. Um, we know that when we go into a hotel or a hospitality setting, that actually we want to book a room with the best possible view. And very often that's the view overlooking water or trees or greenery, as opposed to looking over a city. Yep. Um, and actually room rates can increase. They're more likely to get booked up more quickly. And actually people want to spend 36% more time in biophilic hotel lobbies. So whilst all these building studies for different building sectors mm -hmm. uh, may not sort of be immediately pertinent to the home. Um, many of them are in a way because actually, you know, if we're not going out so much and we're working from home and we're doing all these different things, actually the home becomes the place where we don't just sort of sleep. Yes. We also work. We we uh, entertain guests. Um, we, we talk with one another. So they do start to, you know, we would recuperate after an intense day or after illness. So you know, it's starting to take our homes are becoming ever more functional. So I think as a result of that, these studies that have happened over the last 30 years are more relevant than ever uh, in a post pandemic world. So I think I think that's really important. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, and that's and, a lot of the work just, that we do. You know, and in our what... course, we do outline some lots of those statistics. Oh, good. I just had an idea when you were talking there, two things that popped up, two big areas or niche markets, if you will that are literally exploding in definitely in North America, I can't say in, in the UK because I'm not sure, but here we're seeing um, a massive shift towards short-term rental, working with investors to help them develop, uh, you know, either a vacation rental or a short-term rental situation for, uh, you know, a city, people traveling there or having to be with someone who is sick in the hospital and are going to be rather than a hotel room, you know, it's a hospitality industry in a sense. But the other demographic that is really huge, and that's because of the aging population, is senior move, uh, senior move management and working within the residential care homes. And I see, you know, what you were just talking about is applicable there. So, so someone who is working in that field would benefit from taking the training because it would expand out 
uh, their knowledge to be able to create a more nurturing environment. I mean, sometimes you are up against establishment and they don't quite get it, why things have to be uh, painted a certain color. But I know one of my my students just had a challenge in a retirement home that she's working in with the colors that she had selected, the people, the administration are not understanding how it affects cognitive behavior. And she was looking for the language to be able to articulate that well, I guess, is really worth that. And I think this would really just take it, it to another depth for people in those both of those niche markets, you know, outside mm. of just working with people in homes. Yes, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's important to educate oneself to understand what the key principles and concepts are that exist behind biophilic design. And I think then put those ideas into practice by learning about the 14 patterns, but also not just sort of learning about it, but find ways of engaging with those ideas through uh, drawings, through exercises, through tests, uh, and creating your own Pinterest boards as well, so that you understand and get more deeply ingrained with the patterns. Because whilst the course is very much focused on the residential setting, once you've got these ideas in your mind, it's very easy to then translate them into other, other kind of building typologies. Is there any support to um, sort of early childhood development, you know, working with someone who's expecting a baby and maybe helping design their nursery and then create that nurturing concept within that one room so that everybody in the household, as they come into that environment, starts to say, wow, I feel better here. And, you know, rather than take a whole house approach, have you ever thought, uh, not thought, but obviously have you ever an experience where it's just been one room that's been um, changed and then people have felt that difference? Um, through the whole house. Yes, I mean, you know, over the over the sort of last 25 years, we've done multiple projects across a range of different residential settings, looking at all sorts of different spaces. Um, in our book, we do look at the, uh, the design a healthy home. We do look at the, the the design and creation of healthy children's bedrooms. So in part, it might be about minimizing dust and the buildup of dust, which can cause breathing difficulties and asthma. It might be about removing uh, volatile organic compounds or toxins in the air that off-gas from different materials, brominated fire retardants found in fabrics. Um, it might also about be about how you create sort of easy to clean, clutter-free surfaces, the introduction of different colors that might be stimulating in some areas where they need to work, but also calming and relaxing other areas where they need to relax or sleep. And also about circadian systems uh, um, which are basically our, our kind of body's reactions to periods of light and dark and the importance of connecting children with natural light as a means to get them to um, have, have a sort of good balance of, of melatonin and serotonin, the, the body's sleep-wake hormones. And that can help children to sleep better at night, but also to wake up feeling more restored. Um, and there are ways that you can do that naturally, but also artificially through circadian lighting systems. So Yes, I mean, we, we've investigated the subject and I uh, think it's really important, um, particularly as you've mentioned previously, is that many children don't have that deeper connection to nature, something that's, that's um, sort of been recognised by the likes of Richard Louvre in his book, Last Child, Last Child in the Woods, where he talks about nature deficit disorder in children, which essentially is how children nowadays have less contact in nature, partly because of the kind of... Um, the sort of lure of television, of devices, and uh, the, the kind of lack of space for children to play in nature, but also the perception that nature is in some way dangerous. So because of all those reasons, uh, there is sort of le less connection to nature for children. So I think we have to work a little bit harder to reconnect children with nature um, and help them to learn the lessons of how to uh, respect it, to recognize it, and essentially to restore it, because that's what they're going to have to do. Yeah, save the world. It's been a pleasure. Actually, one more question I just thought of. Um, yeah. So one of the reasons why we're having this conversation is to introduce our audience to this new uh, concept, but also to alert them that we are actually bringing this uh, course of yours to North America through the Academy. And I'm asking you, is the book that you just flashed up there, do you want to put that back up again yeah. for people? Can they? I know they can find it on Amazon. Is this going to be a good support for them? It's not. Is it necessary for them to have it with the court, with the uh, program, or would be expanding out? No, it, right. it sort of expands it out. So, so the course yeah. really investigates biophilic design in the home, which is how you can enhance nature connections. Um, the book, Design a Healthy Home, essentially is. Uh, 
the format of the book, it's 100 ways to create a happier, healthier place to live. So in this, we sort of tend to look at other aspects, things like uh, indoor air quality and water quality, how to support healthy sleep. Um, so there's a whole range of different things. So it's sort of it's a it's a sort of a, it's a useful addition alongside the course. Awesome. Yeah. Not necessary. Super. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I so thank you for your time. Wish you all the best for the future. A wonderful 2023. Healthy, of course, and uh, best for the season. Lovely. Thanks for being Thank you very much. Have a happy holiday. You too.